Hello and welcome to another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and I'm excited today to continue our journey through C.S. Lewis's classic, The Screwtape Letters. This is a HarperCollins hardcover edition of the book, but if you're fascinated by Lewis like we are, check out some of our C.S. Lewis videos right here on the YouTube channel. Or if you're more of a reader, you can check out his early 1940s introduction to Athanasius's On the Incarnation, which is part of our Seaharp Timeless series. In our last episode, we were looking at letter number 11, so today we turn the page and we'll be in screw tape letters, letter number 12. My dear Wormwood, obviously you are making excellent progress. My only fear is lest in attempting to hurry the patient, you awaken him to a sense of his real position. For you and I, who see that position as it really is, must never forget how totally different it ought to appear to him. We know that we have introduced a change of direction in his course, which is already carrying him out of his orbit around the enemy, meaning God. But he must be made to imagine that all the choices which have affected this change of course are trivial and revocable. He must not be allowed to suspect that he is now, however slowly, heading right away from the sun on a line which will carry him into the cold and dark of utmost space. The image that comes to mind as I read that opening paragraph to you, uh, some of my Air Force friends might call it sort of the vector, that, that's that aim that changes everything about the course and direction of, say, a flight, or in this case, our spiritual lives. I'm sure you've heard this analogy too, like if you have a massive ship on the ocean, if you do not set the course properly and it's only off by, say, one degree, well, right off the bat, that one degree doesn't seem like much, but 100 or 200 or 1,000 miles later, it makes all the difference in the world. So as we dive into this chapter, that's going to be about sort of that spiritual direction of our lives. What I want to remind you is our spiritual lives are not a passive thing. Our spiritual lives are not things that are happening to us. So rather than allow the evil one or circumstance or the world around us to kind of nudge us, uh, nudge us off course just by a hair, I'd remind you that each and every day we get to set the course and aim for where we want it to go i.e. abiding in Jesus. Let's continue. For this reason, I am almost glad to hear that he is still a churchgoer and a communicant. I know there are dangers in this, but anything is better than that he should realize the break he has made with the first months of his Christian life. As long as he retains externally the habits of a Christian, he can still be made to think of himself as one who has adopted a few new friends and amusements, but whose spiritual state is much the same as it was six weeks ago. And while he thinks that, we do not have to contend with the explicit repentance of a definite, fully recognized sin, but only with his vague, though uneasy feeling that he hasn't been doing very well lately. I don't think it was during the reading of this book on reading together. I think it was during Abide in Christ. But I shared with you just a word that a good and really truly dear friend of mine, Mike, and I used to share with one another. We would check in with each other at least every couple weeks just to talk about our spiritual lives. And a catchphrase of ours became, we know the difference. That's what Screwtape is trying to warn Wormwood against. For you and for me, we can wake up on any day of our human lives and actually take the temperature of our spiritual life. If it has dropped beneath the threshold of that intimacy, that close abiding that we have experienced, well, what are we to do? We are to go to Jesus, to talk to him about it, to maybe look at the last few days and diagnose perhaps that we've drifted away into an old pattern of sin. But most importantly, we are to bring our full and complete attention to the fact that every day we may have just as much of Jesus as we've ever had. So friends, do you know the difference? Can you take that sort of spiritual temperature and can you come back to him and say, Jesus, would you raise it again? Would you bring me back into that full alignment that was everything? I'll continue. This 
dim uneasiness needs careful handling. If it gets too strong, it may wake him up and spoil the whole game. On the other hand, if you suppress it entirely, which, by the by, the enemy will probably not allow you to do, we lose an element in the situation which can be turned to good account. If such a feeling is allowed to live, but not allowed to become irresistible and flower into real repentance, it has one invaluable tendency. It increases the patient's reluctance to think about the enemy, again, i.e. God. All humans, at nearly all times, have some such reluctance. But when thinking of him involves facing and intensifying a whole vague cloud of half-conscious guilt, this reluctance is increased tenfold. They hate every idea that suggests him, just as men in financial embarrassment hate the very sight of a passbook. In this state, your patient will not omit, but he will increasingly dislike his religious duties. He will think about them as little as he feels he decently can beforehand and forget them as soon as possible when they are over. A few weeks ago, you had to tempt him to unreality and inattention in his prayers, but now you will find him opening his arms to you and almost begging you to distract his purpose and benumb his heart. He will want his prayers to be unreal for he will dread nothing so much as effective contact with the enemy. His aim will be to let sleeping worms lie. Friends, this is why it is so completely and absolutely vitally important that your, let's call it, quote-unquote, Christian faith is actually direct experience of the living Jesus. If we allow our Christian life to become an experience of just sort of like a Christian worldview without any of the direct connection heart to heart between yourself and your living Savior. Well, yes, then this last paragraph becomes completely possible. You start to dread prayer because prayer is boring. You don't want to spend time authentically in the Word because it's almost like homework now. But if on the other end of your prayer is the actual Jesus who's at the right hand of the Father listening with an ear to your voice. Well, then that is exciting. That's living, it's alive. And if, as you read the Gospels say, and you realize that all of these movements through the Galilee, uh, his going to the cross, his coming back from the dead, is the one you know. It's real. It's not just something that was written down as a fabulous fable. Well, then it all becomes very true, very uh, invigorating, alive. So what has it been like for you of late? Are you sort of benumbed, as C.S. Lewis says there? Sort of sitting back and letting your Christian life happen to you? Or are you leaning into the one who is himself the Christian life? In fact, the way, the truth, the life. Let's continue. As this condition becomes more fully established, you will be gradually freed from the tiresome business of providing pleasures as temptations. As the uneasiness and his reluctance to face it cut him off more and more from all real happiness, and as habit renders the pleasures of vanity and excitement and flippancy at once less pleasant and harder to forego, for that is what habit fortunately does to a pleasure, you will find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. You no longer need a good book, which he really likes, to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. You can make him waste his time not only in conversation he enjoys with people whom he likes, but in conversations with those he cares nothing about on subjects that bore him. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods. You can keep him up late at night, not roistering, but staring at a dead fire in a cold room. All the healthy and outgoing activities which we want him to avoid can be inhibited and nothing given in return, so that at least he may say, as one of my own patients said on his arrival down here, I now see that I spent most of my life in doing neither what I ought nor what I liked. The Christians describe the enemy, God, as one without whom nothing is strong, and nothing is very strong. 
strong enough to steal away a man's best years, not in sweet sins, but in a dreary flickering of the mind over it knows not what and knows not why, in the gratification of curiosities so feeble that the man is only half aware of them, in drumming of fingers and kicking of heels and whistling tunes that he does not like, or in the long, dim labyrinth of reveries that have not even lust or ambition to give them a relish, but which once chance association has started them, the creature is too weak and fuddled to shake off. Friends, I read that paragraph, and honestly, it is maybe one of the most tragic paragraphs in this book so far. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to waste your life? Do you want to get to your older years and look back and have very little to account for or to even talk about? If you and I grabbed coffee today and I said to you, tell me about life, what would you talk about? Would you talk about the humdrums of your work schedule? Would you tell me about the vacation you're looking forward to in a couple of weeks? Friends, we do not have time to waste. Every single day is the day in which, yes, thank you to Philippians, we may rejoice. And that day may be united to the high purposes of Jesus the Christ. So if you have been feeling that life is boring and that you don't have very much to talk about, if you're starting to sound like the patient is sounding in that quite tragic paragraph, I would remind you, shake it off. You don't have to live that way. Do you think the Lord Jesus wasted a day of his life? We see his life. It is vital. It's thrilling even down to the minutia. Even as he traveled the roads of the Galilee, just walking with his friends, there was conversation around the kingdom of heaven. When he arrived in a new town, he was able to carry the kingdom of heaven intact into it so that people who met him were set free and healed. That is the calling for our lives. There's not a minute to waste. There's no reason to look at it and think, ah, it's one day after another. Yes, it is. And every day may be his lived out by you. Last paragraph. Boy, I'm all fired up right now. You will say that these are very small sins. And doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. Right in the middle of that last paragraph, I'll read it again. Do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. To my passion about that last paragraph before, let me remind you as we close this episode that the only thing that actually matters to you and to me is the extent to which we abide in Jesus, the living one. The way that we use the hours of this day of our life to unite ourselves to him, to find ourselves distant, as we sometimes like to call it, and not accept that position. The degree to which we walk into the grocery store this evening to pick up something and see that cashier who needs our full attention in the spirit of Jesus, that single moment might make the rest of your day as if nothing. Friends, it's for you and for me to prove to this world that he's in fact alive by showing his life in ours. So thank you for joining me in yet another wonderful chapter, another letter, letter number 12 in the Screw Tape Letters. I'm so grateful you'd be on this journey with me, and I look forward to our next episode. Have a wonderful rest of your day.